All right, welcome everybody um, to our webinar here today. We're going to give everybody just a couple of other minutes, a couple more minutes to join. But thank you very much being, for being here, and we'll start off here really soon. In the meantime, for everybody who's already here, feel free to introduce yourself in chat. Just name, location, who you're with. You'd be surprised on how much of a difference it can make whenever looking for partners or looking for people to connect with. Good to have you on, Amanda. All right, we're starting to get in the mid 20s, so I think we could probably go ahead and get started. So welcome everybody to the Clean Energy Funding for Rural Businesses webinar. This series is a joint effort between the Virginia Department of Energy and the Weldon Cooper Center for Public Service at the University of Virginia. Next slide, please. So this is the second webinar of our two part series on clean energy funding for rural Virginia. And today we'll be looking at a couple of different federal funding opportunities for rural businesses and farmers. Now, while we're kind of focusing on those two fronts, we're not necessarily saying that those are the only people that are applicable to either of these funding opportunities. So if you don't perfectly fit either of those two categories, feel free to stick on. You'll probably see a few funding opportunities that fit for you as well. We do want communities to come away from today's webinar with a myriad of information that they'll be able to make available and to share these funding opportunities with your communities at home. So whether you're a direct applicant or whether it just makes sense to reach out to your local agricultural businesses or small businesses, uh, we won't really want you to come away with this thinking about how you can share these different funding opportunities with everybody in your community. So next slide. So. Just to kind of get some introductions rolling, my name is Austin Counts, and I'm the Rural and Industrial Clean Energy Programs Manager with the Virginia Department of Energy, and I'm located in Wise County, Virginia. On the call here today, helping with tech and also to discuss some of the tax programs, we have Ryan Dorland, our Rural and Industrial Analyst with Virginia Energy on, in, in my office as well. And with the Weldon Cooper Center, we have Elizabeth Marshall, the Senior Projects Coordinator, and Emily Yang. And as I already mentioned a little bit, our goal for this webinar is to help Virginia rural communities identify and assess the clean energy funding opportunities available at the federal level. There's a lot of funding opportunities out there, so we're really hoping to be able to dial down and at least give you all a good sample size of some of the projects or some of the programs that may be relevant in your community. Virginia Energy um, is formerly known as the Department of Mines, Minerals, and Energy, and it houses the state's energy office and the Rural and Industrial Clean Energy Program. We kind of act as a resource to communities across the Commonwealth for assessing the abundance of clean energy funding or of energy funding in general available through things like the 2022 Inflation Reduction Act or the 2021 Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. And so there's a lot of different funding opportunities out there. We're really just kind of help here to help guide communities through what their options actually are. The Rural Industrial Clean Energy Team specifically is located mostly in Wise County, but is available to all rural communities across the Commonwealth to help with meeting your public and private sector energy goals. And so after this webinar here today, always feel free to reach out to me or Ryan Dorland um, if you have any questions on anything that we talked about today or any other opportunities that you'd like to have in your community. Next slide. So to start off with just a little bit of housekeeping, um, of course, you probably already noticed that today's webinar is being recorded. That means the video slides and all of the Q&A will be recorded and posted online following the webinar in a separate document. Any unanswered questions that we have today will also be answered in writing and provided on the web page. And so feel free to keep the uh, link to that website ready and we'll let you know whenever a lot of this information goes up. Next slide, please. Also, as I already mentioned, feel free to use the chat to introduce yourself today. You never really know what connections you can make uh, for a funding opportunity by simply sharing your contact info. So please do so whenever you have the, have the time or the ability to do so. 
We'll also be using the Q&A panel today. And if you do not see this Q&A option on your screen, please find the three dots at the bottom of your screen, click them, and find Q&A to bring up the panel. We'll be using these questions throughout the webinar today, so make sure to put them into the Q&A panel as soon as you have that question so that we can address each following each funding opportunity. Next slide. So we have several resources that we want to talk about here today, and we have, so you can see that we have a pretty full agenda. First, we want to discuss USDA's Rural Funding for America program, also known as REAP. We will talk about the Energy Improvements in Rural and Remote Areas program through DOE. We'll briefly discuss some tax information that all localities should know, uh, all localities and businesses should know about. And then finally, we'll have a short lightning round of some other funding opportunities that may be of interest. So with that, I think I'm going to go ahead and start us off on the agenda today, and I'm going to pass it over to USDA Tracy. The floor is yours. Hi, thank you for having me here today. I'm here to present the Rural Energy for America program, which we reference it as REAP. My name is Tracy Crespock, and I'm an energy coordinator for the state of Virginia. A little history about Rural Energy for America program. Rural Development's first energy program was authorized in 2002 and then reauthorized in 2008, growing in 2014 and 2018 due to the success of the program. In 2002, the IRA or the Inflation Reduction Act was funded $1.7 billion for REAP and $304 million for underutilized technologies and technical assistance for a total of $2.02 billion. REAP is available as grants, loan guarantees, or a combination of grant loan guarantee. REAP can be used for RES or renewable energy systems, EEI or energy efficiency improvements, and that would be for rural small businesses and ag producers. As far as the energy efficiency equipment and systems, only ag producers can apply for those through the guaranteed loan. REAP grant funding is broken down into funding for system installations and technical assistance. If you wanted to apply for RES or energy efficiency, you have to do two separate applications if you're doing it in the same fiscal year. You cannot do more than one application of each type. REAP RES or EEI can cover up to 50% of the total eligible project costs or 25% pre-IRA funds. Loan guarantees can only cover up to 75% of total eligible costs. So if you are only doing a loan, then it's 75% max with zero grant funds. If you're doing a combination of the grant and loan guarantee, then the percentage of the grant will lower the percentage of the loan to equal 75%. For fiscal year 23, everything's considered underutilized except for solar, biomass, biogas, and energy efficiency improvement. Prior to the IRA funding, REAP had two competitions a year. Now we've expanded it to quarterly competitions. Applications not funded will roll over to the next quarter. However, if it is not funded at the end of the fiscal year, which is September 30th of every year, the application will be withdrawn. Who is eligible? Rural small businesses based on SBA's size determination standards. 
A small business is an entity that meets the SBA side standards and meets one of the following entity types. A private for profit entity, cooperative, electric utility, or a tribal cooperation. Agricultural producers. An ag producer would be someone who has 50% or more of their income from agricultural operations as a sole proprietor or entity. The percentage is calculated on the average of gross agricultural operations income of the entity divided by the gross total income of the entity for the five most recent years. If the entity has been in operation for less than 60 months, use the average gross agricultural operations income and gross total income for as long as the entity has been in operation. Ag producers can be located in rural areas or non-rural areas as long as there is production on the project side. Our definition of ag cultural producer is a person including nonprofits directly engaged in the production of agricultural products through labor management operations, including the cultivating, growing, and harvesting of plants and crops, including farming, breeding, raising, feeding, or housing of livestock, including ranching, forestry products, hydrophonics, nursery stock, or aquaculture, whereby 50% or greater of their gross income is derived from the operations. How to determine project location eligibility? You would just visit this web website, eligibility.sc.egov. Follow through by clicking on the Rural Business tab. Click on the first category of the programs. You'll see REAP. And then you put in the address, do a search on that map, and it will tell you if it is eligible or ineligible. And then you would print that page out and put it in with your REAP application. What types of projects are eligible under REAP? REAP allows projects such as solar, wind, small hydroelectric, anaerobic digesters, biomass, geothermal, wave and ocean power, any technology that is commercially available and results are reliable. Research and development projects do not qualify. You must be able to provide adequate and appropriate data to demonstrate that these resources are available. REAP also on offers funding for energy efficiency projects that can include lighting, heating, cooling, ventilation, fans, automated controls, insulation. This is not a complete list of items. This is just the common items. The technology has to be commercially available. The energy audit has to show that what the recommendations are for the improvement. And if it is not listed on the energy audit, then it is not an eligible project. Research and development items do not qualify. If you have any questions, feel free to, to reach out. A few additional program requirements worth mentioning. Renewable energy systems may require a feasibility study depending on the risk of the project and the type of the project. If it is a typical solar installation, then no feasibility study is required. If it is an abnormal solar installation or requires a battery backup, then a feasibility study is required. In regards to energy efficiency projects, energy audit or energy assessment is required along with at least the last 12 months of utility bills. If there are no 12 months utility bills, then it is not eligible for the energy efficiency program. All projects have to have an environmental review before a project can even 
start. Some projects are going to require an environmental report such as ground mount solar installations. What funding is available? REAP allows a maximum grant award of up to 50% of eligible project costs. You cannot request more than a million dollars for renewable energy systems or $500,000 for the energy efficiency improvement with the total if you're doing a renewable energy with the energy efficiency, two separate applications in one fiscal year, you cannot exceed $1.5 million. To sum up this slide, to apply for up to 50% grant funds, basically solar can go up to 50%, energy efficiency can go up to 50%. Anything that is clean energy with zero greenhouse gases can go up to 50%. This screen shows you a small list of eligible project costs and another small list of ineligible project costs. It is not necessarily inclusive of everything, but it does give the most common items that we see. Be careful about making payments prior to receiving a application complete letter stating that the application is definitely complete and that the environmental has been approved. Anything prior to that, it will not be eligible costs, and we would have to subtract that out before calculating the grant funds. Grant writers cannot be paid from grant funds. Technical assistance for REAP. This slide is for technical assistance type grant, basically for state agencies, higher education departments, or utility companies that can apply for the EA RITA grant or the Energy Audit and Renewable Energy Development Assistance grants. But this is good to know, at this point, Virginia does not have any grantees, but if we can get universities or utility companies to apply for this grant, then they can be a source to use to turn to to have uh, a discounted energy audit in order to apply for REAP's Energy Efficiency Improvement Program. Here's some examples of REAP projects. REAP Guaranteed Loan Funding. Guaranteed loans only go up to 75% of the total project cost. Minimum request is $5,000. Maximum request is $25 million. REAP is applied through, REAP loans are applied through 
whatever lender you choose and you'll be working with the lender and they submit the package to USDA to review and approve at that point. Since lenders offer different terms, you want to make sure that you reach out to a couple of different lenders to get different rates and terms to figure out which is best for your situation. Now for the energy efficient equipment and systems, that is only through loans for ag producers only. For energy efficient equipment, you can only go up to 15% for the EEE, and it's through loans only. Any questions that you have about REAP, that would be going through me, uh, Tracy Kresbach, as the Energy Coordinator. Application packages actually will be emailed to me. Uh, if you need the package, I can actually email you a copy of the most updated forms, and an unofficial list of items that are needed as supporting documentation with your application package. You can contact me directly with any questions that you have for REAP. My name is Tracy Kresspock. My email address is tracy.kresspock at usda.gov. My telephone number is 804-287-1606. Please reach out if you have any questions. Thank you and have a great day. That was great. Thank you so much, Tracy. Um, I would love to facilitate a little Q&A um, to talk about the opportunities that <clears throat> Tracy has just covered. Um, if there are any questions, I don't see any questions in the Q and A right now, but if you have any, please uh, feel free to submit them. We've got a couple minutes set aside for this. So I'll just hold for a moment and see if anything pops up. I'm not seeing any questions come through right now, but you all have Tracy's email. Feel free to email her directly or if through the course of this webinar, um, something comes to mind, uh, feel free to go ahead and put it in the Q&A. Oh, we do have a question here. Okay, um, Tracy, the question is, would you consider nonprofits for TNA providers? What, what was that question? Because the one that I see is available to small farms. Uh, the question is, what would you consider nonprofits for TNA providers? Um, I will have to double check on that because I'm not as fluent with the technical assistance as I am with the REAP program since we haven't had anyone apply for the grant for so many years. So I'll double check on that. Um, as far as the question about small farms, it doesn't matter the size of the farm. It's more of um, just having a, a business established for your farm. Uh, a lot of the farmers that we have have um, their residents on the same farm that they're farming with, and we just have to separate the resident part out of the business portion of it. And as long as they don't exceed whether they're applying as a small business, a lot of them apply as a small business because they just use the next code that they obtain from their taxes uh, to determine that they are considered a small business. But if they do apply as a true ag producer, then uh, as long as they are more than 50% of their production, their income from ag production, then they would qualify. So yes, they could be fine for small farms.
And I see, I see another question that came through the chat here that says, um, is there a deadline or is this program rolling? Um, so there, there is a deadline uh, that we do it at this point. It is quarterly. The current deadline is June 30th, but that's for any grants greater than 20,000. And then the next one is September 30th, and that would be for any grant amount. Uh, and, and then it would just keep going quarterly for the next year. Um, and as far as whether or not there's a deadline or the programs rolling, at this point, that's, that is a scheduled deadline for the quarterly, but uh, that would change probably next year uh, after the IRA funding is over and then we'll, we'll see what the Congress goes from there. We might go back to two a year instead of doing quarterly like we are with the IRA funding. And yes, we will be posting a copy of the recording of this presentation as well as the slides on the event website. All right, thank you, Tracy. Um, next, Brian, if you'll pull up. Um, I would like to turn it over to the US Department of Energy's Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations, Katrina Piali, who will kick us off with the presentation. Great, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, and thank you again for this opportunity. We are so thrilled to be here to talk with you all today. Um, so as you heard, my name is Katrina Pielli and I lead the engagement office in the new Department of Energy Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations or OSED as we call it. And I'll be kicking us off today. Next slide, please. So just a couple of quick words before we dive in, um, really just to set the stage. So we are actively engaged in a financial assistance planning process, and we are excited to talk to you about that specific effort, as well as go into some questions and answers at the end of the presentation. But we are subject to a couple constraints that we just wanted to flash up on the screen here so that if there is anything we cannot answer, you know why. Uh, we really are limited to just sharing um, information that's publicly available, and we can't discuss any specific application or the details of a specific funding announcement that, again, has not already been made public. Next slide, please. So because we are a new office, I just wanted to take a moment and set the stage for what we're really all about here at OSED before my colleague tells you about this exciting opportunity that we hope you all will be um, interested in applying for. So we were set up um, in December of 2021 in response to the bipartisan infrastructure law, uh, more commonly known as Bill or IIJA. And our mission is to deliver clean energy demonstration projects at scale in partnership with the private sector. And we do take that public private partnership approach very seriously. And through those partnerships, we're looking to accelerate the deployment, market adoption, and equitable transition to a decarbonized energy system. And because that equitable transition is in our mission, we really are looking to invest in clean energy projects that support quality job creation, advance environmental justice, and facilitate an inclusive energy transition in all communities, making sure that benefits flow throughout, including to those disadvantaged. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to give you a sense of the scope of our funding. So um, between that bill and the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, we received more than $25 billion for those demonstration projects, specifically looking to scale the clean energy technologies that we need to tackle our nation's most pressing climate challenges and achieve net zero emissions by 2050. And the program that we're here to talk to you about today is the one you see on the right with that red circle. It's that billion dollars that Congress has entrusted with us to advancing energy improvements in rural or remote areas. So next slide, please. And so I'm pleased to introduce you to my colleague Juan Villegas, who is the demonstrations project officer for the ERA program. And he's here to give us a little bit more background information both about the ERA program, but also that exciting grant announcement that we're here to talk to you about today. So Juan, over to you. Thank you, Katrina. Um, next slide, please. 
first of all, I just want to thank you all for being here and uh, just listening to our presentation. Um, I was start over the air program overview, the infrastructure investment and job acts like Katrina just mentioned. Uh, also more commonly known as the bipartisan infrastructure law or bill authorizes DOE to invest 1 billion in the era program or any improvements in rural remote areas. DOE's era program is managed by the Office of Clean Agent Demonstrations, or also for short. Also will provide financial investment, technical assistance, and other resources to advance clean energy demonstrations and energy solutions that benefit rural and remote communities. ERA aims to fund energy projects with three specific goals as shown on the right side of the screen. We'll deliver measurable benefits to energy customers in rural or remote areas by funding replicable energy projects that lower energy costs, improve energy access and resilience and or reduce environmental harm from energy generation and or energy transmission and distribution supports new rural or remote energy models using climate resilience technologies, business structures that promote economic resilience, new financing mechanisms and our new community engagement practices and build clean energy knowledge, capacity and self-reliance in rural America. Next slide, please. Today, we're very excited to share with you that on May 11 of this year, DOE announced 50 million in federal grant funding designed to support small community driven clean energy projects requiring between 500,000 and 5 million federal funds through our ERA grant flow. To use barriers for participants, this grant flow uses a simplified application process and will award fixed amount grants with no cost share requirements. This mechanism significantly reduces financial reporting requirements associated with larger DOE awards, such as our first grant FOA. Only those applicants who submit a pre-application and are invited to submit a full application to the ERA grant FOA will be eligible to submit a full application for the ERA grant FOA. Submission deadline for the pre-application is July 13 of this year. Next slide, please. For the air grant, applicants must identify at least one area in the United States, including U.S. territories with city, town, or unincorporated area that has a population of not more than 10,000 inhabitants. This is really key requirement for funding. Clean any projects Funder under this law must satisfy at least one of the objectives listed in Bill Section 4010.3C3, which you can see on the screen. This resilient clean energy objectives are improving overall cost effectiveness of energy generation, transmission, or distribution systems, siting or upgrading of transmission and distribution lines reducing greenhouse gas emissions from energy generation in rural or remote areas, providing or modernizing electric generation facilities, developing microgrids, and increasing energy efficiency. Next slide, please. Now I'll dig a little bit deeper into the air grant. The air grant fund has one topic area which solicits proposals and to implement of community driven energy projects that will use commercially available technology. Uh, that's a key characteristic of this law. As a total project cost of at least 500,000 and at most 5 million. To reduce barrier to entry, the air grant flow does not require a cost share, as mentioned before. It has a pre application of 20 questions with a 10 page limit and the full application has 17 questions with a 18 page limit. For the pre application, there's a pre application template applicants may use, which is available for download from author change under the posts of this form. Applicants are not required to use the pre application template, but are highly encouraged to use this template. 
The template includes all 20 questions and suggested word counts for each question. For the AR grant FOA, we estimate the number of grants will be between 10 and 100 with a maximum project period performance of five years. These grants will be fixed amount grants with an emphasis on performance over compliance. Next slide, please. Examples of projects that could be constructed under the AIR Grant FOA are provided here for illustration purposes only. Applicants are not limited to these examples and encouraged to propose projects that best address the energy priorities of the community. Example projects include installation of standalone microgrids, Saturn or upgrading of transmission and distribution lines, grid stability and resilience, with substation improvements or other electrical infrastructure improvements such as hardware or software improvements, installation of geothermal heating or ground loops for heat pumps, deployment of small hydropower, innovative siting for of solar panels such as over canals or, or agricultural land to reduce local siting constraints and enable new ownership structures. Use of biogas from agricultural wage waste, either from biogas capturing or biogas generation through an anaerobic digestion to either fuel equipment on site or for pipeline injection. Next slide, please. The AIR program is funding two separate technical assistance programs, or TA for short. The first one on the left is the air technical system that's provided by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, or NREL for short. The one on the right is DOE's National Labs. Um, it's funded, it's provided by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, Environmental Justice Driving Communities Technical Assistance, or EJ Tech for short. For both of these te technical assistance, uh, it's a no cost to eligible applicants. For one on the left, for Enroll TA, it's available for the pre application or the grant for. Uh, TA consists of up to eight hours of discussion time with DOE lab staff and experts to develop the concept, the preliminary development plan and timeline, the community benefits plan or CBP, among other topics. For the one on the right, for EPA's EJ Tech Tax, it's a partnership between EPA and DOE. There are 17 regional centers, each one receiving at least 10 million to remove barriers and improve accessibility for communities with environmental adjusting concerns by providing training and other assistance to build capacity for navigating federal application system, working on proposals, and effectively managing funding. They will also provide guidance to awardees for their community engagement and facility meetings and provide translation and interpretation services. And with that, now I'll pass it back to Katrina to review the key deadlines, technical system program, and other near users. Next slide. Great. Thank you so much, Juan. Um, so really just wanted to make sure that you all knew exactly when these important dates were. This $50 million grant opportunity is very exciting, and we really need all of you to get those pre applications into us by July 13th. So, just under a month. Um, then, those that are actually encouraged to submit the full applications will have those due on October 12th. We expect to announce those selected uh, projects to enter into negotiation around February. And then finally, to actually announce the awards in spring of 2024. So again, um, please keep January 3rd, excuse me, July 13th in mind as the important date. Next slide, please. And so Juan and I are, are thrilled to be here and we're excited to be talking with you, but just wanted to flag that if you have a specific question about that grant FOA, those need to be submitted um, to that email address you see on the screen, which is era, e -R -A, grant at hq.doe.gov. Um, all of those questions will actually be handled by our FOA team and included on a Q&A log that's posted online. 
and you can access that Q&A log now. So you can go to the OSED Exchange website, which is what you see here in the bottom left of the slide. Um, you can search for the specific era grant FOA, or you can just find it on that list. And there you'll be able to see not only that Q&A log, you'll be able to download the um, FOA itself and all of the associated forms. Um, and then finally, to actually go ahead and apply, we do need you to do that through OSED Exchange. Um, the last thing I'll mention is that please do refer to the FOA for the definition of any of the terms or any additional information for requirements. Um, we really do uh, encourage you again to submit questions to that email address and we'll be happy to take those that we're able to here in a moment. Um, next slide, please. So again, thank you to Virginia Energy and the University of Virginia for having us here today on behalf of OSED and the entire ERA team. Juan and I thank all of you for being here and listening to this webinar. And the FOA does remain that controlling document. So if any information was presented differently, please do use what is in the FOA. And so now we'll turn it over to Elizabeth for the Q&A. Thanks. Thank you so much, Katrina and Juan. This is really great information. It's such an exciting opportunity. I really hope that uh, folks from Virginia will submit that pre-application um, and, and, and start the process to try to take advantage of all these funding opportunities. Um, all right, I'm looking at the Q&A. I don't see any uh, specific questions come through yet. But if you have questions, please enter them. We'll see if we can answer them today. Or as Katrina outlined, you can submit them online. It looks like there's a question in the Q&A right now. See one question here. Um, can funding for ERA be used for study analysis? I can take the question. Uh, the ERA grant FOA, it's, it's for commercially available technologies and for construction projects. Um, so uh, I don't see like a study can be done just based on the requirements in the FOA. Um, Unless it's beyond a pilot study, uh, and you can see in the FOIA it has more detail. But we and DOU have TRL levels, and it has to be, I believe, is TRL eight. So I don't know the top of my head, but in short, uh, you no. Know, usually studies are something that's been piloted or tested, and this is beyond the phase of a feasibility study. This is for technology already been tested and proven. It's available for commercial. Uh, Purchase you need it has can be warranted, it can be serviced, and it's been tested before. Another question. Um, so I'm sorry if I missed this, but will future application periods open for the ERA program? Before Juan answers that, um, I did just want to come in and say that there are a number of other programs at DOE that do provide funding. Um, for planning and different studies associated with projects um, through just a broad basket called technical assistance. Um, so I'll put a couple of these into the chat here in a moment, um, but just wanted to flag that even though, as one said, it is not eligible under ERA, um, there are other programs that do provide that type of support. Um, so Juan, back to you for the next question. Thank you. Actually, I was planning on that because I, it's so, we did a prize and that kind of covers that. It's not for construction. Uh, it's for partnership and financial uh, funding or for, I guess you can call it project and there's no construction. Uh, that's one example. So like Katrina said, there's there's other programs out there. Um, at this time for the air specifically, I don't think we have studies. Um, and sorry, what's the next question? 
Thank you. The next question is, um, will future application periods open for the ERA program? Um, so just going back to the presentation, we at the beginning we said we got a billion just for the ERA program. To date, we have put on the street of around 365 million spread out in three funding opportunities. Uh, March 1st, we launched the first ERA grant, which is a cooperative agreement type of uh, grant. And then the prize, which I just mentioned earlier, is for uh, the financial track and partnership track. Uh, I'm mentioning that it will make sense in a second, because if you make the math, 1 billion minus 365, it's about 600 million left. I might be off on the math, but there will be future opportunities that will open up and we just have to keep track on our website. And if you saw what Katrina shared with you guys, if you guys go to our Allstep website, which I believe is in the chat as well, you can actually register to get newsletters. So you get notified when and if a new area grant funding opportunity comes available for the public. Those are the questions uh, that we've received so far. Um, so I encourage everyone to submit their questions. Um, continue to submit them to the Q and A, or if it's specific uh, to the to the DOE um, era grant program, and you want to submit it to their online uh, portal, feel free to do that. Um, and with that, um, I think I'll turn it over to Ryan Dorland with Virginia Energy, and he'll discuss um, some tax incentives and rebate opportunities that are available to. Virginians. Um, thank you so much, Ryan and Katrina. Thank you. Thank you very much for presenting this information. Ryan? Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I have a few items to present uh, just on the tax uh, credits and rebates that are available to Virginia. Um, one disclaimer here, though, is that this does not uh, constitute professional tax advice or other professional financial guidance. And that also some of this information may change given further guidance from the Treasury Department. So please do not use this as your only source of information when making uh, decisions or investments. So briefly in about five minutes here, I just want to go over a little bit about the investment tax credit ITC and the production tax credit PTC. The investment tax credit is a tax that can reduce the federal income tax liability or the percentage of the cost of a solar system or some other alternative energy systems that are installed during the tax year. For more information on this specific application, reference IRS form 3468. The production tax credit or PTC is a per kilowatt hour based tax credit for electricity generated by solar and other qualifying technologies for the first 10 years of a system's operation. And for more information on this, please visit IRS form 8962. Generally, project owners cannot claim both the ITC and PTC for the same project, although they could claim different credits for co-located systems, like, for example, solar and storage, depending on what guidance is further offered from the IRS. Eligible projects for both the ITC or the PTC would be multiple solar and wind technologies, municipal solid waste, geothermal electric, and title. For the ITC only, we would have energy storage technologies, microgrid controllers, fuel cells, geothermal, including heat pumps and direct use, and combined heat and power, microturbines, and interconnection costs for smaller projects. For the PTC, this would include biomass, landfill gas, hydroelectric, marine, and hydrokinetic projects. For more information, you can visit uh, the website below and we'll be sharing this information again later. 
what projects are eligible for the ITC or PTC? First of all, the project must be located within the US or territories. It must include new or limited previously used equipment, and it cannot be leased to a tax exempt entity, for example, a school, although tax exempt entities are eligible to receive the ITC in the form of a direct payment. In this table, this goes over uh, both the ITC and the PTC based on the time that the project is put into service. For the ITC, the full base rate credit is 30%, and for PTC, it is 2.75 cents per kilowatt hour. Now, this assumes that these projects meet labor requirements, including prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements. For the ITC, in addition to that 30%, there may be additional add-ons for domestic content, for energy communities, and for low-income residential or qualified economic uh, benefit projects. In theory, these will stack together and a project could earn up to uh, 70% with all of these conditions being met. An example here, just briefly, of an ITC calculation. If a tax liability is a million dollars, uh, the ITC could reduce that by 30% in the year the system is put into place. For PTC, this is based on the uh, energy produced by the system over a period of up to 10 years. There are calculations involved in a, and uh, available on a DOE website that will give uh, this example and other examples of calculating this, but you would receive a, a tax benefit for each year the project is in service up to 10 years. For more information, you can visit www.energy.gov, EERE, -E, Solar Articles, Federal Solar Tax Credit Resources, or you may write directly uh, to the IRS or submit questions and we will guide you to the appropriate place. And with that, I would like to pass this along to Emily Yang from the Weldon Cooper Center at UVA. Hi, thank you, Ryan. Um, so this will just be a quick presentation on some other funding opportunities that might be relevant for you all. You can go to the next slide. So Renew America's Nonprofits is a funding opportunity from the DOE's Office of State and Community Energy Programs. Uh, this opportunity aims to reduce carbon emissions, improve health and safety, lower utility costs for buildings owned and operated by nonprofits. Project examples could be lighting upgrades, HVAC upgrades, or window replacement. However, renewable energy projects are not eligible for this opportunity. The DOE is awarding five to 15 prime recipients, $45 million in grants, with individual awards expected to be around three to $9 million. There are multiple roles that you can apply as. Um, the prime recipients are nonprofits who would be the project lead with a portfolio of subrecipients um, offering the subrecipients technical assistance, anything that they need. But as if you apply as a subrecipient, you'd be a nonprofit that owns and operates a building that needs energy efficiency upgrades, who has some sort of demonstrated financial need and has the potential to benefit disadvantaged communities. Subrecipients will be subawarded up to $200,000 uh, under the prime recipients grant. Uh, both prime and subrecipients must be 501c3 organizations. However, you can also be a partner who coordinates with prime recipients to give subrecipients technical and financial support. 
Next slide. The Building Pathways to Infrastructure Jobs Grant is an $80 million grant with 25 expected awardees. Uh, this grant is aimed towards funding training programs that fulfill the bipartisan infrastructure law by advancing manufacturing, information technology, and supporting renewable energy and efficiency sectors. The program aims to train individuals who are un unemployed, underemployed, or incumbent workers who are over 17 years old to enter important regional industries. Uh, this grant is responsive to local and regional infrastructure needs by investing in upgrading power infrastructure and considering how communities are impacted by job loss in fossil fuel industries. It also hopes to design programs that are worker-centered, which means that the training programs should ensure attainment of quality jobs that offer paid leave, uh, pathway progression, and other worker benefits. And on the slide are just a few of the examples of people who are eligible to apply for this grant. Next slide, please. There are two tracks that you can apply into. Um, the development track is specifically tailored to regional and local training programs in rural and underserved communities. Applicants must establish a program in one uh, area explaining how the proposed training model uses evidence-based training, such as apprenticeship uh, apprenticeship programs, as well as use some sort of unproven strategy for education and training to support the sector. The scaling track invests in already established partnerships that uh, have evidence effectiveness in implementing a training program. So the scaling track is focused more on expanding already effective designs, whereas the development track is focused on creating those partnerships. Uh, the DOL requires at least two employer partners who will provide hiring opportunities to any participants trained through the grant. Um, however, there are other partnership requirements that are unique to the scaling and development track. So if you want to apply, then please be aware of those. Of course, these slides are just a brief overview of the opportunities to give you an idea of whether or not they're a good fit for you. For more information, go to the websites linked in the slides or email the point of contacts. Next slide. Um, these are some other funding opportunities that we think might be relevant for you all. Um, if you would like more information on them, you can revisit the slide deck after it's posted on our landing page. And I'll hand it off to Elizabeth for some closing words. Next slide. Thank you so much, Emily. Next slide. So just as a reminder, if you want to submit any questions to the Q&A, we'll be answering them in writing and posting them on our website uh, following the conclusion of this webinar. We'll also be emailing attendees a post engagement survey. Um, please plan to complete it and let us know um, what you liked about this webinar and how we can best support you moving forward. Uh, there are tons of funding opportunities uh, rolling out, you know, every day, every week. Um, and so we would like to, to know if this is helpful or what we can do to help facilitate additional applications from Virginia and take advantage of those federal funding. Next slide. Here are some resources that might be um, uh, helpful to you. Of course, grants.gov is a complete list of federal funding opportunities. The USDA Rural Development Energy Programs website um, outlines energy programs uh, and funding opportunities specifically to rural communities. And um, as was mentioned earlier, NREL does offer technical assistance for local government and tribes. Um, they have a few different tracks. One of them is an expert match program that has rolling applications. So there's no specific deadline. You might find yourself needing some assistance. These technical assistance tracks, expert match tracks, provides 40 to 60 hours of technical, technical support and are designed to take place over one to two months. A lot of these federal funding opportunities that are announced have very short windows between the time they're announced and the time the applications are due. Um, so I just encourage you to, to continue to monitor announcements as they come out um, and hopefully take advantage of them. Um, with that, next slide. I'd like to thank you all for coming. If you have any questions, please contact Austin. Um, at Virginia Energy and visit the Virginia Energy website 
um, as well as this um, event website for the uh, video of this recording and the slides. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.